Yep. No, it worked for me. So, oh, it's flipping ahead on me. All right. It does not like that one slide there. There we go. So this is what the site looked like uh, when, um, all right. So I mentioned that this was the um, first water plant for the city of New Braunfels. Um, I think they um, put the first wells in, in in the early 1900s. New Braunfels took over the site in about 1950s uh, and just continued to develop the site. And so this is what it looked like when New Braunfels Utilities uh, outgrew the site and moved their operations center up to their service center, which is now on 306. This property came before the MBU board of directors who are community appointed members. And they said, what are we gonna do with this property? We have um, you know, this really important water plant here in the corner. The headwater springs are here. This is Bleeders Creek and all the rest of this, we, we're not gonna be able to use. We can't redevelop it for MBU purposes. Uh, uh, the flood of 1972 really impacted this property heavily. Uh, it just wasn't, you know, the right place to, to redo the operations here. So the board said, you know, this is a really important property. It's historically significant. It's environmentally very important. We can do better than what we've done before. So they crafted this vision with stakeholder input from the community to create this vision for the headwaters, a master plan that would remove the asphalt and impervious cover from this site and create an environmental education center. Uh, and so that's what I was hired on to do was kind of take over this master plan um, that was created in 2014 and see it come to fruition. So we've begun that journey, as Joel mentioned, in, in phase one, and you all have seen that. So I won't spend a lot of time on that, but we're just kind of quickly looking at that. The important piece of phase one was to divert the stormwater that used to rush across this, that unimproved surface and land right at the beginning of the Comal River um, to improve the riparian area along Spring Run 4, create some trails for the community, uh, provide education and some historical information. So this is kind of, you know, phase one was a big, was a big um, lift and it started back in 2014. Um, it kind of, you know, wound up MBU contributed about $10.7 million to that. And the community contributed uh, over a million and a half dollars to see phase one come to fruition. So as that was happening, as the construct, the deconstruction, the restoration of phase one was happening, I was hired and we created a 501c3 partner to um, call it the headwaters at the Comal. Uh, we established a joint use agreement just recently with MBU and the city of New Braunfels on the work around um, the nonprofit working at this site. And we drafted and, and updated the mission and vision for this project. We also came up um, with, you know, a strategic plan to, to guide our, our vision for that. We've worked with many of you as volunteers out there, um, and we were in the midst through all these years kind of figuring out what our next capital campaign, what next phase of the project um, will work on. Uh, and so, again, in phase one, um, part of our strategic plan what came up with four um, goals around that um, or four areas of work for the Headwaters nonprofit. And they were foremost to protect and conserve the Comal Springs. The picture at the top there was just after construction started on phase one. You can see that spring cap area. We had removed a third of that cap um, to improve the habitat for the endangered species that live in the spring system. And this bottom picture is what it looks like more today. So really just improved that very beginning of the Comal River. Um, the pollutant load that I mentioned, all that um, stormwater that used to rush across that property unchecked used to deposit the equivalent of two Ford F-250s worth of pollutants in the very beginning of the Comal River, the very first springs that make up our Comal River in New, Bron in, um, New Braunfels. And the work that we have done and the work that we continue to do will reduce that load um, by almost 94% um, 
So virtually diverting all of that stormwater away from the springs and allowing it through these natural stormwater methods um, to filter and polish before it winds up back in our aquifer system. Uh, let me hop back to that picture. This kind of gives you an overview of all the different um, habitat restoration zones that we'll have on the project uh, once it's completed. Uh, this is this kind of savanna prairie area and the way that the stormwater currently filters through lands in these vernal pools and uh, polishes and cleanses. Up here, we'll have a xeriscape area. There'll be a woodland area. And along here, we have our riparian and riparian woodland. So uh, the number of ecotones that kind of mimic where we are in the hill country. And in fact, that's one of the important environmental features of this project. Right over here is the, end, is the coastal plains, the end of the coastal plains in the Blackland Prairie. And right along this escarpment here, and the reason why the Comal Springs exist is because of that escarpment and a fissure in the, the karst aquifer rock that we have that allows the Edwards Aquifer to bubble up to create those springs. So it's the very beginning of the Texas Hill Country. So we're right here at the intersection of some really important ecotones in the state and a great um, education tool and demonstration tool to share that with the community. So again, you know, the picture on the top is what it looked like in 2016. And this photo on the bottom is the same view. Looking back, you can just see the pavilion. Whoops. <laughs> Clickers run away from me. Um, here, and then it's right here in this photo. So that's virtually the same view about five years later. The spring cap area, again, I'm channeling the water away from that important area. This is another important feature, this um, diverter pipe, which oh, uh, right here, you can see the water would overflow from this treated water. So Edwards Aquifer is pumped, treated with chlorine, fluoride, stored in this tank to go out to the community. In um, so some situations, it would overflow and run right into the springs, which are here. Now it's channeled with this diverter pipe into another stormwater catchment basin, which allows the gases, the chlorine and all to dissipate before it gets back to the springs. Really important for the endangered species and fish. Oh my goodness. Um, sorry about that. Um, the Bleeders Creek area, uh, it doesn't look very pretty. It's kind of this backup drainage area, but it holds um, really important habitat for the fountain darter, which is one of the endangered species that is important and endemic to the Comal Springs. So improvements along there, um, some of the other areas you all I'm sure are familiar with. Clicker, I don't know if it's me or the clicker. It's very touchy. Hair trigger. Yeah, it is a hair trigger. Um, the, in phase one, we refurbished one building. If you've been to the site, you've all been there. It's our covered pavilion, which we use quite a bit. Um, so uh, another one of our important pillars of work, probably tied with uh, protect and conserve, but it's educate and demonstrate. So I'm really proud that um, our team, Lauren, who I'm sure you all know, and Jack now, and Victoria, um, who helps us on our watershed education, have really developed a great suite of programs. And, and actually, we thank groups like the Native Plant Society and the Master Naturalists and others, too, because we couldn't have done it without the support of groups like yours, uh, who help us put on like landscape series. Um, Jack has created these restoration tours. We have um, education programs to engage our youth. We've started having field trips at the site and even have a little summer camp now focusing on watershed education, but really all of our rich um, Texas Hill Country ecosystems here. There's a concept that's being talked about a little bit more frequently now, it's called One Water. It's nothing new, it's just a new fancy term for um, something that you all are probably really familiar with and know um, so well being native plant lovers, but you know, our water is all in one cycle, right? Every, all the water that we have on earth is here on earth. And it is all, it's either in ice or it's in rivers or our oceans. 
it's not going anywhere. And so all of that water makes up this cycle and how we manage and treat that water is becoming more and more important. Lots of times we allow our stormwater to just run off into some concrete sluice and go polluted back into our oceans or our rivers. And we know now and we're recognizing that we can do better by that. We can use methods like the Headwaters is using with green stormwater drainage and check dams and things so that we instead capture that stormwater, that polluted water, and help it become healthy again before it gets back into our drinking water. So our drinking water stays um, clean we can think about how we're going to manage floods, water. We know that um, soil is held in place better if they have our native plants and those long roots to keep it from eroding. If we do more of that, we're protecting against stormwater. Um, we can use AC condensate on large buildings to use for irrigation instead of using our precious potable water. Um, there's lots of new, new and old technologies and treatments that we can do better. Um, and New Braunfels Utilities is working really hard to be a leader in those strategies. And the Headwaters is working to be a, a a community convening place where we can have those conversations and engage developers and engineers and others and how we can do better um, in our community. Partner in research. Um, the Headwaters is just a great place to conduct a lot of research. Uh, Jack and perhaps you all have helped him in doing our bio blitzes and capturing a lot of information on iNaturalist, which I hope if you all don't use iNaturalist, you, you will if you, if you like to get apps on your cell phone. The Headwaters has gone from zero, um, you know, native identified species on our property to over a thousand different um, species, bugs, um, creatures, plants, grasses, trees. I mean, they're just collecting things all the time. And so we have created from nothing, from an asphalt covered parking lot, this really incredible biodiverse habitat at our site. It's really exciting, I think. Um, we're also doing things like uh, demonstrating and testing different types of materials. So we have a lot of de decomposed granite paths. They don't always work in every application. <laughs> Susan, I think you know that here at the library too. So this is a recycled rubber product. You know, I don't know. I smelled a lot of off-gassing when we put it in. I'm like, I'm not sure this is really, you know, as natural as I want it to be. Okay, it's a recycled product, but you know, it's supposed to be somewhat impervious, so allow some of the drainage to go through. So we're, we're trying to test lots of different um, opportunities for us to all, you know, have, have other options instead of just asphalt and concrete. Um, lots of different groups that we've partnered with in research. Um, and something that's just really important to me is kind of creating that community. We have lots of great little stories now about people who have come to our space um, for a program or um, a yoga class or whatever. And just the way it's impacted them, not just while they're there, but, you know, beyond that mental health relief, stress relief, um, connecting to others during COVID when, you know, we were one of we, you know, one of the few safe places where you could really, you know, we could come together, but we knew we were spread out. We were at, you know, far away from each other, but there was still that sense of community and volunteering and being there. Um, we have some great programs, uh, lots of, in fact, there's Susan right there and John Davis, and uh, I'm sure some other familiar faces here on our volunteer um, days. We have this great Earth Day celebration, which hopefully you, you all have participated in. Um, companies come out and provide volunteer um, hours as well. And you can see like the value of volunteers. I mean, Volunteers are priceless. You can't put a value on them, but when you have to do it for tax purposes, this is what we've come up with. So <laughs> it's really great. And we've had over 11,500 visitors and that's without having great public restrooms or any conditioned space. So we think we're doing pretty well. Um, so next phases. Um, Framing the foundation is what we're calling our next phase. Our first phase was called the foundation builders and they kind of laid the foundation for the beginning of this master plan. They're all recognized on a fence that you may have seen out there. Our next phase is really focusing on what I just mentioned. Um, I don't know if you know, but second graders aren't really good at using the portalettes. 
They can't push the, um, the little pump at the bottom to wash their hands. They can't get enough leverage on that. So they have a hard time at the hand washing stations. Um, the first field trip we had out there, we had to cancel the first time because it was pouring rain. They came out the second time and it was cold and the wind was blowing like no other. And they're all just like huddled in the corner and, you know, gathering in our office. So we really need some condition spaces so that we can guarantee that you can come out to our site, no matter what the weather, obviously we want to be outside most of all, but we need some backups. Um, we also have this really exciting archeology span component to our project. And we're looking forward to incorporating um, the learned experience that we've had from our archeology span excavation. Um, and so phase two will include the main entrance off of Klingemann Street and the main building. Um, and I'm gonna get into that a little bit more. So here's a new kind of visual. This would be um, right in the very front, we'll have a little drop off for buses and handicap parking um, right along Klingemann Street. And then you'll enter under that kind of covered or that open arbor and take that path. And that would go through the trees that are already out there and into the warehouse space. Um, here's a, a picnic commons that we'll have for field trips or pe people to just come and use and enjoy. Um, the pic picnic commons will be are sponsored by HEB. So they've made a nice donation to our project from that. Let me check, I'm not, oh, let me go back to this photo. Uh, over here, um, so the main building is all along here. It was that ugly warehouse space that you saw a couple slides ago. This section will become our event space. Uh, and there's some great rainwater collection here. Then this will be this open air pavilion with uh, an, an education pod and then a visitor center and another community meeting space. So this is the main event space. It seats about 200 people. Um, there'll be a small breakout boardroom next to it, full catering kitchen, um, the restroom facilities. This covered walkway will connect. This is the visitor center. The uh, um, event space was down here and the education pod is kind of off to the left. We'll also be able to include some of these uh, beginning of our demonstration gardens in the middle. So that will be a really great opportunity to take kind of that massive prairie, uh, you know, wild area and, and cultivate it a little bit. And hopefully, um, I love the whole nice plants, you know, really still be focusing on natives um, and plants that are right for this area, but do it in a way that people then can envision it at their own home and garden. Um, so the big fundraising goal for the next phase is $8 million. Um, and whoops, we have um, one point, no, 6.2 of that raised and secured, which is enough to get us started on construction. Um, we hope this fall. And uh, what we'll be doing from this point on is raising all those funds for tables, chairs, AV equipment, education supplies. Uh, we may have a little bit left for um, some of the buildings, but we are quite confident we'll be able to get started on the construction, kind of break ground, let people know that things are happening and that we're moving forward. So, uh, oops, my, this, I'm sorry, it's, it said where it begins up there, but it's supposed to say framing the foundation. And uh, like we had our donor recognition wall on the other um, project, we will have this um, display to recognize the people that donate to this phase of the project. Do you all get what those little circles are? Size of the donation. Oh, well, yes, but they're supposed to represent something like bubbles from bubbles. the springs. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> blue, we got the blue. Yeah. We're trying to be creative here. Uh, we'll have it, you know, just something that really says that, you know, it, it's people who help to make this happen. And obviously we can't do it without those um, donors. So here's the wall. Um, it will be right, that's the entrance to the event center here. This walkway will connect to what we have already, that covered pavilion out there. So it's really just gonna make the whole site so much more accessible, um, so much more welcoming and um, many more places for people to use uh, for events, for meetings and other opportunities. So 
I don't know, you all, you we might not have any, are any of you MBU customers? A few of you, okay. So MBU has started a new program to also help us. Um, not only is the nonprofit helping to match MBU's contribution to the project and raising these funds for construction, but we're also working to, right now, um, MBU helps provide a lot of our operations and maintenance costs as well um, for all of the work that we do and putting on programs and running the site. And so uh, this uh, roundup program will start giving us a little bit of contribution to offset that and to make us a little more self-sustaining as a nonprofit organization. Um, other ways you can get involved are to become a member. We offer memberships to the program. So if you come out while you're not volunteering um, and want to bring your family, you know, you can come for free. We give discounts on programs. Uh, we also have some special members nights. So our evening of lights, Luminaria, um, we'll have a members only night at the beginning of that week. Um, we offer some other little perks to our members. Uh, you could just come out and volunteer, which many of you do. And we thank you so much for that. It means everything to Is us. Susan in the background there? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> She's there a lot. She probably could have given this presentation. Um, encourage your business if you're still working to support us um, by coming out for a team building or making a donation, uh, attend our programs. We're on Instagram, Facebook. Uh, we have a great YouTube channel where we have this great big archaeology excavation and we did a lot of public outreach and engagement with that. So we have a whole host of videos that talk about all the different components of the archaeology. If that's something that interests you, you can find that on our website, on our YouTube channel. Um, and we're really excited as well as that. Um, so this is going to be right here will be phase two, um, what we're working on right now. But we already have funding from TCEQ's uh, 319, which is a watershed protection plan to do the parking area across the street. So as soon as we are finished this area and they're done kind of putting all their work equipment over here, we'll be able to improve this area, which will be um, permeable uh, parking areas, more trees and greenery, and just a really nice place for people to park. We hope to add electric vehicle charging stations over there and uh, hope to eventually have solar panels on our building here, which we could be net zero as well. So really trying to think big about this, make it a, you know, a legacy project for our community. Um, similar to we've had we've you know similar to the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center or the San Antonio Botanic Garden down in San Antonio but just a really special and unique place for New Braunfels that honors our heritage um, our history the long history of people coming to these springs you know 10,000 years or more because these Comal Springs are the most significant springs in the American Southwest um, they are that unique and that special, and we want everyone who's moving here and that had lived here forever to really understand that and learn how to all how we can all be better stewards of our natural, beautiful natural um, resources here in in Como County and um, the Texas Hill Country. So. That's my story, and I'm sticking, I'm sticking to, to it. it. Does anybody have any questions for me? Yes. Yes. Um, how does, let's You're say, we have uh, Aqua providing water on the west side of Kingsway? Yep. And uh, it goes into the water with me. Mm -hmm. Now, does that ever get to uh, get into the canal? It does. Um, the Guadalupe and the Comal connect um, just south of, well, um, let me see, where is it? It's kind of just north of the Faust Street Bridge. So it's just out of, New do you know where the last tubers exit and that big Schlitterbahn is? I have, I have yet to take advantage of that. Okay, well, if you go down there, that's still the canal that goes past Schlitterbahn and then it connects with the Guadalupe there. And the Guadalupe, or the Comal, actually, that intersection with the Guadalupe helps provide a really important freshwater flow to the Gulf of Mexico. It's, it's a really important contributor to the Guadalupe at that point in order to provide the flow uh, for the bays and estuaries along the coast. Well, the reason why I ask that question is, um, I, like I say, I live on the west side of Canyon Lake, mm -hmm. and the Canyon Lake water system, yes. 
from the street behind me, mm -hmm. and I caught them running a hose from their tank through a neighbor's yard down the culvert, which would eventually go all the way south to Rebecca um, Street. And, uh -huh. and I called the TCEQ, and he kind of like, well, I don't know. I, mm -hmm. it. I worked for the companies doing that kind of research, and they ended up not doing it. I heard it's not good. Yeah, but, well, that's good. But you that's know, all that. Kind of stuff. You yeah. don't know. Right. Do it. Yes. It's true. You can't see it. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Oh, restating. So that. So for the people on Zoom, we were just talking about where the Comal intersects the Guadalupe and then how important. Um, everyone's discharge is into our streams and, and, and river flows. Um, and so we can all help to be watchdogs maybe um, of that and, and make sure to let um, the appropriate agencies know when you're, when you're seeing something and that shouldn't be happening so that they can look into it so we can prevent that from happening. Yes. Uh, just to kind of underline the importance uh, of this particular water source throughout history, could you give a few of the pertinent points that were discovered during that archaeological survey? Yes, sure. Can you explain so, how technical that was? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So um, the archaeology survey that happened at the headwaters at the Comal project, um, before the project even started, you know, this is a government property, a municipal utility um, operates this property. So there was an extensive archaeological assessment done. And this property has been pretty abused over time. It was the site of a big fish hatchery. It has this, you know, original water source. You saw that the impacts that MBU had on it just covering it and asphalt and all these metal buildings. And so the archaeologists determined that uh, they probably wouldn't find much of significant archaeological value on this site because of that in, pre, you know, impact over the past couple hundred years. And instead, what we found was as soon as we began removing that asphalt and impervious cover, uh, we were finding um, cultural artifacts that dated back 2,000, 3,000, almost back to eight or 10,000 years before present. Um, it, it was incredibly significant, so much so that we had to stop at one point and do a, kind of a, a take a deep breath <laughs> and figure out what that meant for the project uh, and for New Braunfels utilities. And so we were allowed to continue to do our work um, because it was important um, for protecting this site from the environmental hazards. But then we, New Braunfels Utilities had to commit to doing a, a research mitigation to offset the, the un, unintentional impacts that they had had. So first of all, we had to come up with a lot of different strategies. Like we couldn't put in big concrete footers because we dig below the native soil and all of that. So had to go back and um, they had to research, excavate over um, a, five different pits on site, excavation pits, uh, just, you know, one square foot at a time. We found numerous, um, they, the archaeologists, not me, found numerous um, burned rock middens was the biggest uh, kind of single cultural feature that they found. And those are, you know, basically a fire pit. But what was some of the fascinating things that came out of that, um, well, one, 3,000, 4,000, 6,000 years ago, people didn't have fires every night. I mean, it was difficult to put together a fire to cook food. So it would have been for a special reason, probably when there were more people around, perhaps ceremonial, hard to know. Uh, one of the interesting things about some of these fire pits is we'd find, they'd find one in, intact, um, like perfectly intact, and they'd excavate it and they'd scrape the soil down, which was, you know, maybe another thousand years. And right underneath there, in the exact same spot, would be another fire pit. So how did they know that like, that exact spot, right? It's pretty fat. It was pretty fascinating. Then within those fire pits, they found all kinds of shells, bones, you know, different pieces of um, 
botanical matter um, that they could glean, what kind of plants the um, people at that time would have been using, what kind of animals they were eating, um, shells. And then of course they found a whole range of, of points or um, tools that they uh, would have used for preparing their food, capturing their food, killing their food, uh, cleaning their food. Uh, and so we, they, a lot of this was lithic debris. We also know that this was a place because of that um, Edwards Plateau, that um, escarpment that's right there, that is a perfect material for creating points and um, the tools that they would need. So they'd get like a big rock and they'd just start chipping it, chipping it away and they'd wound up with, you know, like a metate type uh, a bowl and a pestle kind of thing, a mortar and a pestle, or they'd find um, different kinds of points of all different um, age periods, over 100,000 different um, cultural remnants on this site at just in this small, relatively small area that we excavated this part of this. Uh, we have a thousand page report uh, that will be coming out um, very soon for the public. We have it, we have a you know, a special version right now. And so what we will be doing uh, in this next phase of the project is trying to represent, recreate, um, bring that story of how people have been visiting this very site um, for thousands and thousands of years. And I think another really important piece of that is that most of the cultural sites that are found around Texas are found, well, they're either on private property, so nobody else has access to them, but the people that own that property, or they're along the side of a highway or, you know, some something that's being torn up. And so the archaeologists are called in and they kind of gather everything and they take it back and they put it, you know, in up at Texas State or down at UTSA. We have the opportunity to, to find, to display the artifacts exactly where they were found. And for that important reason that those people came there because of the Comal Springs, because they are so significant. And over all of these hot, dry periods like we're experiencing now, um, those springs would have flowed at some level because of how important, how significantly the, um, their water flow is. So kind of a, a unique and unusual piece of this project that we didn't even know until we started the, <laughs> the remediation. So, thank you. Yes. Are all parts of the site handicap accessible? Um, yes and no. Um, what we have, I have had, I think it depends. Um, we were trying to make them so, and we have had, um, for instance, a uh, gentleman in a wheelchair who came and went through the whole, our whole trail path. Um, I think that might be easier, like um, sometimes our decomposed granite paths don't hold up very well. And so there'll be a little bit of cracking or some bulging. So we're working to make them as accessible as we can. Um, and we'll continue to improve on that um, as we move along. Yes. And you're using the crushed or decomposed granite just because it's pervious. Yes. It's, it's also scenic. Yes. Can you say the question again, please? Oh, sorry. We uh, the question was um, uh, handicapped accessibility, uh, which we are working on and will continue to work on, and then also why we use the decomposed granite. Um, yes, mainly because it's pervious to some extent. Um, it is scenic as well. There's really no, you know, it's, it is really hard to find the right material for a site like this. Um, and so that is an opportunity that we have to explore some other options because decomposed granite isn't really the best in all the situations that um, little spring run that I showed you. It has a pretty good um, slope to it and it can t and it's right there at that bottom of the watershed so it would get the full force of the water when it rains and so it washed out multiple times and so that's why we wound up with that recycled rubber product we have taken the concrete foundation of a building that was on the site and cut that into pavers and reinstalled it that's worked really well in a couple of areas as also so it's, it's a little bit of trial and error. 
trying not to spend too much money on that as well. And so we're, we're trying to learn some tips and tricks and um, looking out for other examples. So if you come across anything great when you're visiting other sites, please let me know because we'd love to try them. There was a product that was advertised 10 years ago that was a uh, curvy in sleeve that was cement yes. concrete and you know it didn't look very pretty or scenic but it allowed for yes water to penetrate i don't know if that's and it's probably not an inexpensive project right um, so that question was a great one, the pervious concrete. We actually, our sidewalk outside on Lakeview is pervious concrete. Um, it is supposed to be cleaned regularly with like a power washer because the little pervious, it like stuff can get in there. And so it is a problem. It was expensive. The city came back to work on a sidewalk project and they wouldn't put in that pervious concrete where they tore ours out. So yeah, it's, you know, it's it's a challenge. I, I will admit it, but you can be sure I always have my eye out and I'm always looking for for better options. Um, accessibility is a big one, too. I mean, how do we make sure that we're accessible for as many people for everyone? I mean, that's our goal is to be accessible for everyone. So. Apparently, a previous concrete also has a problem if it has freezes. Mm. Interesting. We 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 haven't noticed that so far, um, but I'm not. That, yeah, that could very that. well be true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great questions. Yes. So did I understand you to say that you still have an active well outside? Yeah. So yes. New Braunfels Utilities has um, a really diverse water portfolio. Um, they have a Trinity well aqua um, system. They take run of river rights, the Guadalupe that's south of the of Canyon Lake Dam. Um, but a, a big piece of their uh, infrastructure for the downtown area is from the Edwards aquifer. And so we have two active uh, wells on the property inside that well yard area, and they are pumped and then treated and in, into that storage tank and then pumped out to the community. Yep. <clears throat> That way. It will remain that way unless we can find another source of water that's as good as the aqua as the Edwards Aquifer. I mean, the Edwards Aquifer is just a treasure, which is another reason, like why we're really trying to encourage. You know, let's let's quit with the with the obsession with the huge green lawns that hardly anybody uses, and not one butterfly or or animal or plant can have any benefit from that all right I mean I'm probably I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here but like let's show people how we can still have lovely yards that support our native habitat and our native uh, pollinators uh, don't need a ridiculous amount of water to look lovely and um, just provide a better place I mean I love. I don't. I love nothing less than sitting in a butterfly garden and watching the butterflies flutter around, or you know, the hummingbirds zoom by. And uh, green lawn really just doesn't do that. So, <laughs> so that's what we're trying to inspire is a new way of doing things. Because there's a, a new pump station at at the headwaters uh, that is that was put in since we started phase one, and they had to basically supplying water for people to irrigate their lawns. I mean, that's if we all just kept to the necessity, you know, the, the use of our, you know, cooking and cleaning and just taking care of ourselves kind of and conserved even when we did that, we, we wouldn't need such a huge water supply like, like we're seeing um, the need for now, even with the growth. So yeah, let's keep working together. I'd love to have it. Yes. I'm a member of the Kamal County Conservation Alliance. Yes. And they have a guest speaker, mm -hmm. who's with Edwards Aquifer. Yes. And he's talking about what our water supply is going to be like in 20 years. And I spent time in Colorado and was active in Conservative Colorado in the Rowing Court Conservancy. Yep. Uh, and that's we do this. Yes, we do have to do this. Um, there, and what, remind, let me know the date again so I can tell everybody on Zoom. July 19th. July 19th. At uh, McKenna. At McKenna Event Center, a uh, presentation hosted by the Comel County Conservation Alliance on Water Conservation. Is our meeting. 
no. <laughs> we can talk to a oh, no. lot of times about, can you make the bean yes. bread another night? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, we, we have to do better. We have to do better. Yes, Susan. Because I don't want to be the only one in the picture in the future that you know. <laughs> Why don't you, a lot of master naturalists mm. sitting here, why don't you remind them that Lauren puts out, you know this every week in our out and about, and it's really easy to sign up, and there's a variety, a whole variety of activities that go on. Why don't you mention it for everybody? Thank you. Thank you, Susan, for that great plug. Um, Susan was mentioning that we uh, we have volunteer work days every, pretty much every week. Um, Jack manages those, and Lauren, who's the assistant manager, puts those out on your out and about. And we do a whole host of different activities out there for volunteers, um, planting, lots of weedings. But sometimes I think since Jack's been there, it's been a little better than that. Uh, erosion control. There was a great erosion control work that's been going on. You'll learn a lot while you're there. Um, lots of opportunities to participate. I mean, we even need people to just kind of walk along and wipe our signs because the birds poop on them all the time. <laughs> so if you don't want anything too, you know, too strenuous, but you're willing to walk the trails and just kind of make sure everything looks great. That's, that's an important job as well. So um, you can come out and learn a little bit more about the project and be a greeter when we have programs. Um, we have some great youth education programs if you like working with youth at all. Um, very structured and a great opportunity to participate in that way too. So lots of, um, Leon has lent me his uh, infinite wisdom and project management and just sat down. So we have office things to do as well. I mean, really, there's a whole host of opportunities and, and we'd love to see you out there um, or come and give a program. We're always happy to sponsor a program out there as well. Do you have any idea what the percentage of water is used for lawns? So oh, anyway, that's a good question. I we got We got a letter from ours at Canyon Lake and there they said 75 percent of the water they pump is irrigated is irrigation water. especially as it gets drier and drier so that number goes up yeah it's uh, I, I've taken some irrigation courses to the UK and and those are the numbers clearly it's, landscaping and lawns yeah. is by far after industrial use mm -hmm. yeah so yeah common person it's way up there Yes. yes. Do you, do you um, yes, speak of series? Uh, we, we are just diving into that. A little bit of it is the whole weather, you know, just limited by the weather. But we, um, we have done a few of those programs and we are always open to suggestions on that. And in fact, we're doing a couple, like we're, we're going to host a photography workshop. So, um, and we can give a little stipend to the speaker for coming and presenting. And yes, we're definitely open to uh, having guest speakers come and provide content for our visitors. We love that. Thank you all so much. Really appreciate it. Yeah.